Okay, so hello everyone, I'm Jonas, and today I'll be presenting about object detection with cascade classifiers. So the agenda for this presentation is, first I'm going to go over what are cascade classifiers, because they're not commonly used in FTC. And then I'm going to compare with other methods of object detection, namely TensorFlow and OpenCV-based color detection. And then I'm going to go through the process of how we can actually train a cascade classifier and finally wrap up with ways that the cascade classifier can be improved. So what are cascade classifiers? Well, they're object detectors that work by extracting and selecting features from a set of positive and negative image samples. And they can be an incredibly robust detection method. So, and there's two types of features that we can extract from these uh, training samples. Uh, they're known as HAR features or LBP features. So if you look at here, HAR features, we have edge features, uh, line features, and four rectangle features. So these three types are all the features that we can uh, extract from an image. And then there's also 45 degree rotated versions of these features so that we can see like slanted, uh, slanted features. So if you like to look at the face example here, uh, the eyes, we have it as a edge feature because usually the eye region is a bit darker than the region below it. And for the other type of feature is known as LBP, which stands for local binary patterns. And what this is, is essentially for every pixel, we compare with the surrounding pixels to see if it is brighter or dimmer. And then we binarize that into zeros and ones, and we add those zeros and ones into one number. And we do this for every pixel in the frame. So how do cache classifiers detect an image or detect an object from an image anyways? Uh, first, we have the basic concept is we have a sliding box that goes left and right, up and down, and for each of these within this bounding box, we extract the features within the bounding box. And we compare these features with the features that we've gotten from our positive training samples. And usually uh, the features, we, we pass them through a cascade of classifiers. And usually it's discarded in like the very first stage or in the first couple of stages. But if it makes through every single stage, then it is considered a detection. And we do this uh, sliding box for boxes of different sizes so that we can see objects of different sizes. So how do cascade classifiers compare with other methods of object detection? Well, uh, the cascade classifiers are very rarely used in FTC um, in comparison to TensorFlow Lite, which is somewhat commonly used, and color thresholding, which is the most popular way of uh, detecting objects in FTC. Uh, part of the reason why color thresholding is so popular is because uh, you only have to do like uh, some like changing of the color thresholds and well, for TensorFlow AI and CASA classifiers, since they're machine learning based, you have to go through a training process. For TensorFlow Lite, the training process is uh, very resource intensive. Uh, while in comparison, CASA classifiers, they are uh, relatively lightweight when it comes to training. You can get a decent model by running it on your local machine overnight. Um, and yeah. So after all that, how do we actually train a cascade classifier? Well, we need to have OpenCV 3.4.15. And we need this specific version uh, because later versions don't have the necessary applications we need to uh, train the cast of classifier. And the training process can be broken down into three main points. Um, the first would be gathering samples, annotating the samples, and then we have to go through the process of actually running the training. So for gathering samples, we need to gather both positive and negative samples. Uh, positive samples are images that have the object fully in frame, like you can see here. Uh, the object will be full and it's fully in, in this frame. And negative samples, you can just pick like any arbitrary image uh, as long as it doesn't have the object in it. And typically we need thousands or hundreds to thousands of uh, these samples each if we want a very good result. And to really easily get those thousands, hundreds to thousands of images, we can just take a video and then save each frame as an image. And one thing about these samples is we need, to, we need them to have a variety of backgrounds and orientations. So one thing I found out when I was training mine was that uh, 
I had a lot of dark dark backgrounds within my samples. So sometimes the classifier wouldn't be wouldn't be able to see the object if it was behind a very light background. Another thing is we need the variety of orientations. So it is because the, the sliding box I talked about earlier, it's not rotated in the in any way, it's only scaled. So it can only see the object if it's upright, if you don't include slanted versions in your training samples. So to for the trainer to actually know where the object is within the uh, positive training sample, we need to tell it where it is in the format of a bounding box. So we tell it the x, y coordinate of the top left corner of the bounding box, and then we tell it the width and height. One thing to note is in OpenCV, the coordinate frame goes uh, from positive y goes from uh, top to bottom, uh, which is a bit different from like regular coordinates. And for negative samples, it's relatively easy. We just need a file with the path to each of our negative samples. For the positive training samples, there's two ways we can get these, uh, get the annotation file. The first way is we can manually mark it with OpenCV annotation tool. Um, this will, in within this tool, you have to like manually drag the bounding box, or you could just write a script to automatically do it with uh, the bounding box that you would get from like color segmentation. And with this, you can easily get hundreds to thousands of samples relatively easily. So how do you actually run the training? Uh, So first we need to compile all of our positive samples into a single file using the create samples utility that is provided by OpenCV. So what we tell this create samples is where all of our uh, positive samples are and then the format of the output. And then here is where we decide what feature type we want to use. It could be HAR or LDP. Uh, usually HAR will take slightly more training time and CPU time for yeah, and LBP is a bit lightweight, but it all depends on the parameters. Uh, and here we also decide the width and height of the output. So for example, if I specify 15 and 60 for the width and height of the detection, then the detection that I get when I actually run the classify in real time will always have an aspect ratio of 15 to 60 or one to four because this, the, the sliding box is scaled. So it's not necessarily 15 to 60 pixels, but it could be any size that's the same aspect ratio. And then we tell it the number of positive samples we have. And create samples will output a file, and this file we can just feed directly into the train cascade utility, uh, along with the path to our negative annotation file. And here for train cascade, our width, height, and feature type have to be the exact same as the width, height, and feature type that we gave to create samples. And the number of stages, the default is 20. So the stages is like what I talked about earlier, how many stages it has to go through to be considered a detection. Uh, the default of 20, it'll generally take like half a day to finish training if you leave it running on your computer. And if you increase it, you might get better results, but the training time increases exponentially. And for number of positive samples, you do have to tell that to train cascades. But another thing is, train cascade will always consume slightly more than the number of positive samples you give it. So for example, if I had 1,000 samples, and I gave train cascade 1,000 samples, it might, it might consume like 1,050, and I don't have 1,050 positive samples, so it'll give me an error. So the way we can fix this is just give the number of positive as like 85 or 90% of the true number of positive samples. So in my case, if I had 1,000, then I will give it 900, and when it goes over that number, say it consumes 950, and it won't give me an error. So after you run the train cascade and you wait until it finishes, it'll give you an output file, uh, usually an XML file. And to use this XML file in your FTC code, first we need to connect the control hub to a laptop or your computer with a USB-C. And then we need to drag the XML file into the internal storage of 
the control hub. And usually it starts, and to access it in code, the path for the control hub, the root is slash SD card, and then the path to your file. And you can see here in code, we just create a cascade classifier object with that name. And then within, and then in each frame, we call detect multi-scale, which is that sliding box that I talked about earlier. And then that'll give us a list of detections for it, which is in the format of a list of rectangles. So here's some tests that I did with the cascade classifier. And you'll notice that there's three colors of bounding boxes. The a red means that it was filtered out. Green means that it's considered a detection. And blue means that it is, uh, the, the code thinks that it is the closest poll based on, uh, just completely based on area. And you'll notice that sometimes the cascade classifier will, it will give us a nested detection. Like if you can look here, sometimes there's multiple rectangles within the same rectangle. And we can fix that by just taking the biggest rectangle that surrounds it. So if we have a smaller rectangle that's completely overlapping with a bigger rectangle, then we can just throw out the smaller rectangle. And another thing is uh, sometimes it'll detect features that are similar to the objects. But since the cascade classifier only operates on grayscale images, because uh, in the last slide, when we give the image, when we give the frame to the detect multi-scale, we have to convert it to grayscale first. So it won't take color into consideration at all. So what we can do is we can take consider take color con into consideration after we get our rectangles. So how do we improve the classifier? Well, first off, we can just train with more samples and especially with more background variety because when I was training mine, I had a lot of dark backgrounds which led to it not seeing some of the poles that have a light background. And also you can see here, when we tilt the pole, it does not see it because it's not, I haven't included like a lot of tilted samples within my training samples. And we can also train it using cloud computing, which will give us a uh, really fast training speeds. You can probably like get a really good model with two hours, within two hours, if you use like a cloud computing tool. And next, I'm going to talk about just improving the actual result given by the cascade classifier by retrieving the external bounding box and doing color verification. So the logic for throwing out the detection if it's completely overlapping with a bigger rectangle is relatively simple. We just say if the top left corner is more closer to the origin than some other rectangle, and the width and height is bigger than the another encased rectangle, then the encased rectangle, we can just throw that one out. And for color verification, this is similar. Uh, the first couple of steps for color verification is similar to the one, the, what you do with uh, color detection. So you extract a mask where all the yellow pixels are ones and all others are zeros. And then the next step is we just uh, create a region of interest where the mask is just the rectangle, the bounding box returned by the classifier. And then we count all the non-zero pixels within that region of interest and divide it by the area of that region of interest. And that'll give us the percentage of pixels that is the correct color within that uh, region of interest. And then we can just say, if it's like lower than some minimum value, then it's probably an incorrect detection. And so from my, from my testing, I concluded that cascade classifiers do have a limited accuracy. Now, when the object is upright and the background has a decent contrast, it can detect objects relatively accurately. However, if you have like a very, a background where you did not include it in your training samples, or if the object is in a different orientation, then it will impact the accuracy. And, uh, so for most FTC use cases, color-based detection will suffice, but the use case for cascade classifiers is where color cannot determine the object alone. And thank you for listening.
think there was one question on this. Okay, someone asked, beyond gas in the Zoom, where would April tags come in to this? Well, April tags is uh, one method of just, April tags is considered OpenCV. So in OpenCV, April tag is just like a special type of image. It's a QR code and OpenCV can detect that. Uh, the cascade classifier, it could you could technically train a cascade classifier to detect a, an April tag, but the, the one that the SDK provided would be way more accurate. And uh, the one April tag detection, you can only detect April tags, but with cascade classifiers, you can detect anything. Does anyone in person have any questions? So you could just put the XML file into your, the internal storage of your Raspberry Pi. And I'm not sure how uh, you would like specifically access that. You would probably have to install OpenCV onto uh, the, Rasp the Raspberry Pi you're using, but it would definitely work, yes. Any other questions? Oh. Okay, so how the script that I did was basically I would put the video through like uh, OpenCV and then I would just get the color, the bounding box that I got from color, and then I would just write that color to the NF or the, the coordinates of that box to the file. Wow. We have we have no more questions. I think we'll move on to the next presentation. Thank you, Jonas.